Um, so if you want to have any questions, uh, uh, please use the uh, raise hand uh, function uh, if you want to if you want to speak. Uh, you can also provide uh, information in the Zoom chat, but for uh, the questions, uh, we're also using uh, uh, Slido. Uh, within Slido, you can go to the session, which is listed uh, below. Uh, within the Slido, we have the Q&A, but also uh, a session for uh, having a few questions to for information. Um, this is the agenda of uh, of this session first we have an introduction uh, about uh, the uh, activities we have we have done on the technical architecture and we have a few examples of architecture descriptions for the different kinds of services and we have also a use case uh, about adopting uh, the architecture guidelines uh, after uh, the, the first and the two and the second block we have a short q a uh, if you have questions uh, after those sessions, please use the raise hand uh, functionality uh, uh, for uh, uh, getting uh, the question uh, and getting uh, unmuted and so that you can ask a question. At the end, uh, we have a, a larger uh, a block of Q&A, which we use a Slido. So if you have questions which are not just uh, answered within uh, the session, please put in the questions within the Slido. Uh, then we can address those questions. If you go to Slido and you see uh, uh, questions which you like, uh, please uh, do the thumbs up uh, for the question so that we can also prioritize questions uh, while answering. Um, within the Q&A uh, final session, we start up with a few, uh, uh, with a poll, uh, with a few questions. Um, then uh, we go to switch to uh, uh, Diego. Um, can the screen sharing be switched? I will stop sharing. Uh, then I will introduce uh, Diego. Diego is a technical solution team lead at EGI Foundation within his team. Uh, with technology provider and research innovation projects for uh, uh, technology scouting innovation for the existing EGI services. Diego is also the co-chair of the US Hub Activity Management Board. Management Board. Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. Can you probably see my slide? Uh, yep. I okay, fine. Slide. Okay, let's start then. In this presentation, I will introduce the EOSCAP proposal for the EOS technical architecture. This is made a framework to foster integration and interoperability uh, within the EOSC, within the EOSC environment. Um, I'll start then uh, presenting this proposal, then I will give you some information about the first result of these activities, and I will close my presentation with some information about the next steps. Okay, as you know, within EOSC, the concept of service console composability has been considered one of the most relevant. Where, uh, as composability, we mean the possibility to put together, to allow to work together two or more services to provide added value, then to allow the service together to do something more. Um, then, um, for this reason, in EOSCAB, we developed a service aid integration uh, uh, com and composability framework that is based on interoperability guidelines with the aim to one side facilitate the exploitation of EOSC services and from the other side to foster the service integration, the composability, and also then facilitate the combined usage of EOSC services. As interoperability guidelines, uh, we intend to um, promote the adoption of standards and well-known APIs to support the end-to-end -end composability of the services. This uh, interoperability guideline should be able to lower the barrier to, to, allow, to access the service, to use the services. And the idea is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel but these uh, guidelines should be based 
on uh, existing community practices with no standard interface and so on. So the work that uh, we are doing is mainly to collect uh, uh, information about on the different technical areas about the most relevant standards, API that are adopted, and try to put them together to define these interoperability, gui interoperability guidelines. The idea is not to make these guidelines mandatory, but each provider should be able to uh, decide to adopt them or not. The, uh, our, our wish is that the advantage to adopt the interoperability guidelines will be uh, so big that the providers will be uh, will be um, will adopt them for, um, uh, for will adopt them in for their proper interest. What are the benefits of having this framework? First of all, having this framework, having a, 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 wide, a wide set of, of interoperability guidelines uh, would allow the sciences to compose services in an easier way. In addition, the sciences can rely on infrastructure and EOS compliant, serv compliant service for implementing basic features. For example, uh, a sciences that does need to worry about AI or monitoring or accounting or, uh, or the orchestration on top of a cloud uh, environment, uh, since they can, uh, the sciences can reuse the services uh, delivered by the infrastructure and can focus uh, is a work on the uh, scientific aspect. In addition, the interoperability guidelines can help federated and common services to interoperate and to working together. For example, uh, AI systems from different, uh, from, different, uh, from different communities or accounting services from different initiatives can be merged and working together if they are compliant with these guidelines. So, starting from this, uh, we decided to develop a EOSC reference archite technical architecture, as uh, I would say, the framework, the containers for all these technical interoperability guidelines. Uh, and a reference architecture, you know, is a template solution for an architecture and allow to work, uh, and, and we decided to work at the infrastructure le level. So, um, the idea, we decided to split the, um, the EOSC services in three main categories, the federation services that would be mainly the services to enable the use cooperation or basic features that are, called, that are needed to um, properly support the EOSC. We can call them also use core services using the most recent terminology. The common services that provide generic functionality that can be applied to multiple domain we can imagine a, a cloud orchestrator, for example, of a data repository or data management services that can be reused by uh, scientists from different scientific disciplines, for example, and these are common services, and the thematic services that address a specific research domain. So we split the service in these three categories. Under these three categories, we define the functional categories that where we have identified the uh, functionalities that should be offered by, by uh, the services. And behind of this, we define the main element of this architecture that is the building block. The building block uh, represent the, um, represent um, a, a basic element of the infrastructure and is defined by a set of parameters like the scopes, the features that are offered, the standards that are supported by these building blocks, the API that are offered. We also included the, a list of example services implementing this building block. So if we consider the different uh, features that are needed to implement a uh, scientific uh, service, uh, building blocks can be under the federation and the access enabling uh, category can be the AI infrastructure or a monitoring service. Under a common, the common uh, category can be a cloud orchestrator, can be a, a data repository. Under the thematic category can be a specific, uh, uh, a specific, um, I would say, component uh, that is, uh, is resolving some, some problem that is specific to a scientific discipline. Uh, defining the framework, the, um, the, uh, after we, de we have defined the framework, the activities uh, consisted on identifying and defining this EOSC architecture building block for all the service types. And then we have agreed 
to mapping the feature of each block to a technical specification of the building block that includes an high level architecture that uh, uh, highlight the main feature of the building block, the interface and so on, and interoperability guidelines. So what is needed for a service provider to use this uh, uh, building block from one side, since we know they, uh, we, in the specification, uh, uh, we made available uh, the interfaces uh, to interact with this building block. In addition, for a provider that is willing to provide a service that implements these building blocks, what are the interfaces that they have to develop? So it's a guide for both the providers that are willing to exploit the building blocks that both, and the providers that are willing to implement the building blocks. Uh, obviously, the EOSC is a very wide environment, so um, it's a very complex identifying all the building blocks and, uh, and um, define specification of all them. We decided to use uh, an iterative approach to both identify the building blocks and define a technical specification. And uh, this work has been driven by the use cases. So we selected the most relevant building blocks that should be specified from the use cases. We are working on defining a technical specification, some specification are already available. And the idea is to get feedback from the wider, from the wider EOSC environment to improve them and then uh, creating a new version according. Since this specification should be considered like some live document that uh, need to be uh, continuously enhanced. Obviously, our intention is also to involve people not directly, directly involved in the project, uh, in the, but with expertise in the area of a certain building blocks to work on this. Uh, this slide is to better um, show you what is the concept of building blocks. Uh, when we talk about building block, we are not talking about a specific service instance, but we are talking about a, a family of services that are compliant, that are conform with, this, with the specification of the building blocks. Then a service can be part of the building block if it's follow the technical specification, then implement the high level architecture and the interoperability guidelines that are compliant with the specification. Example of, of, uh, of services that are part of the same building block are, for example, the AI services compliant with the ARC blueprint architecture that it would be uh, within, uh, altogether within the AI building blocks, or also monitoring all accounting systems, the table to exchange, share information between them and working together. Uh, first of, uh, previously, I showed you how we have defined the, um, the framework of the technical architecture to um, identify the different building blocks according to the service type and then define the related technical specification. This slide shows the functional view of the EOSC technical architecture, where we have identified, we have the same three main categories of services, the thematic services on the top, the common services in the middle, and the, the federation services on the left. All these services work together and the user can exploit these services of directly and accessing a thematic or common services or to the USC portal or any other portals marketplace. The most relevant information from this slide is you can see it in the common service area that is has been detailed, where you can see different elements, the work from management, the cloud infrastructure as a service, cloud orchestrator, data discovery, data management, all of them are building blocks. And for all of them, we defined, uh, or we are, we are defining for some of them, uh, the uh, uh, interoperability guidelines that would allow to specify the APIs and the standards interfaces to interact with these building blocks. What does this, this mean? This means that for automatic services, it's simpler using one or more of these building blocks since the thematic service can rely on well-known API standards interfaces. This is showed with the powerful arrows in the slide. 
The same is, uh, uh, is about the interaction between building blocks, since also building blocks can work together to provide added value, for example, to automatic services. This is shown with the, with the arrow, the red arrow in the, in the picture. And you can see, for example, the workflow man management building blocks is interacting with the cloud infrastructure as a service building blocks to the API standard interface. So the main idea is to have clear interfaces and um, I would say, uh, uh, interfaces that are promoted within the ESC environment to simplify the integration work between different services with the final aim to have composite services with, uh, with less effort. This is the main point. Okay, that's all for the introduction to the framework that we have developed. Now I'd like to give you some uh, information about the first result, focusing on the technical specification for federation services that we have, we have developed. This, this, uh, this specification, the federation service can be seen as we, we have what we are currently calling USCO services, they can be seen as candidate services to be included for the, within the USCO serv core services. And for each of these services, we defined, as uh, I described before, an high level architecture, the interoperability guidelines and the related integration options. Then, then it means how a service provider can be integrated with these services offered by USCO. Uh, we have defined a uh, specification for AAI, for the monitoring, for the help desk, and for the accounting. Very important, in, in, for each of these uh, services, uh, we have defined uh, within a distributed architecture, since EOSC, I would say, is intrinsically distributed, but within a, a, uh, this distributed architecture, we have identified if it's needed having some uh, functional central services offered by EOSC and how the uh, ser a service provider can integrate with these functional central services through some interoperability guidelines. Specification for monitoring accounting and help desk are currently open for public consultation. The deadline to get feedback is the, 30, uh, the 31st of May, the end of May. The link uh, to the survey that we have created is uh, in the slide. I would invite uh, everybody to have a look at this specification and provide the input so we can create a second version of this uh, specification in the next month that are taking into account the the input from, you know, from a wider set of, of people. Okay, uh, starting from this, uh, I'd like to show you an example, then specifically about the help desk, uh, or what does mean having this kind of specification. In this specification, we have defined what is the EOSC help desk. In the idea is that the EOSC help desk would provide the first level of support for all the EOSC services, and then in particular for all the services that are currently onboarded in the EOSC portal. A second level of support for the EOSC core services, like the EOSC portal marketplace, the AI, the AI and monitoring, and three, integration option for all the other EOSC services. If you see the uh, diagram on the right of the slide, the big box with the dashed line is the EOSC central help desk that would allow from the EOSC portal, uh, uh, would allow the user from the EOSC portal to submit incidental service request. Then we have a fifth level support team in, uh, in the help desk that will take care of this, uh, of this ticket or this request from the users uh, for some of them in an automatic way. Let me explain how. Uh, then uh, um, the provider, can decide to integrate with this EOSC help desk in three different ways. For example, if a provider doesn't have its own help desk, it's free, it can decide, it's up to the provider to use the EOSC central service out its own help desk. In this case, a dedicated support unit for this, for this service provider will be created and the EOSC will provide the tool to to allow the service provider to manage, manage the request from the users, but obviously the provider will have to provide the people to deal with this request. The second option would be 
uh, when there is a service provider with its own uh, help desk and the service provider want to continue to use its own help desk, the user can directly access the service help desk of the provider as usual, but in addition, since we can receive centrally some requests from services of this provider for, through the EOS help desk, this request will be automatically, so without any, any user interaction, forwarded to the help desk of the service provider to a certain interface, to a certain uh, interface that is specified in the EOS help desk technical specification. So if the provider implement this, uh, this interface, that is this arrow, the ticket will be automatically forwarded to, this, to the provider. This is, I would say, is the nicer way to integrate a provider, but, the, but in this case, the provider incurs in a certain effort, a certain cost to integrate with EOSC since have to implement this integration. It's a low, it's a, it's a low cost, but the, in any case, it exists. So we also included a third integration option that would allow a provider to integrate its own help desk with the EOSC help desk uh, without effort, I would say, since the EOS help desk uh, will forward the request for the service of this service provider to an email. Then, when the ticket is created within the help desk of the providers, the provider will continue to manage this ticket as usual uh, according to its internal procedure. So this is the structure. As you can see, we have tried to create something less invasive as possible, and then I would allow to satisfy the needs of different kind of provider, more mature providers with their own services they want to continue to use, less mature provider that need support from EOSC to, uh, to, to have some operational services up and running. These are the three integration options that I have mentioned. And uh, the arrow in between the uh, um, EOSC central help desk and the provider help desk um, have, have been, the, this interface have been defined in the interoperability guidelines. Okay, that's all from uh, the specification for the core services. Very quickly, I'd like to say that this work is user driven. I mean, uh, uh, we are trying to define a technical specification according to the real needs of the, uh, of the user. Uh, and we use a very wide set of use cases to drive this work. Use cases are coming from all past projects like EOS Pilot. Use cases coming from EOS Cub, uh, EOS Cub like the thematic services and competence center, but also use cases that we have identified to the EOS portal marketplace. And uh, this slide to show you how the different requirements that we have collected from the, from the user communities are driving the development of the guidelines that we have defined. Okay, now to conclude, I'd like to give you uh, some more information about the status and the next steps. Uh, we have already released 13 technical specifications. I, I, uh, these are available in a deliverable uh, um, that has been produced by USCAB. The link is in the chat. But we are also creating a website where the user can easily access and navigate over all these specifications. This will be available very soon. We, uh, we uh, launched in Autumn 29 a public consultation on the overall approach that I present today. We got answers from uh, Eric's EOS class regional project, the infra, other infrastructure and so on. And we got a general positive feedback on the approach with, um, and uh, I think the most relevant comments that we got is trying to make this effort as much as possible use case driven, and we fully agree on this. There is another public consultation that is ongoing, as already mentioned to you before, uh, on help desk monitoring and accounting technical specification with the deadline the 31st of May. And I would invite you uh, again to provide your feedback so we can improve this specification. And finally, uh, the EOS Cub Technical Workshop of this year will be run in a, I would say, in a reduced, reduced format, considering the current outbreak crisis. 
uh, in uh, an online session tomorrow during the Oscar week. So I invite everybody to also join this session to get more, inf more specific information about the specification we are developing. Uh, yeah, there are some reference, and that's all from my side. Okay. Uh, Diego, thank you for this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'm looking at the participant list at the moment. I do not see any hands raised, uh, but uh, then I think we can also switch to uh, the next. I uh, see one hand raised. Uh, There's one question in the chat as well. Okay. Yeah, can you unmute? Yuri? Yeah, okay. So I, I have a question. Yes, this is very interesting development. It's a pity that I missed this uh, at the time it was announced consultation. I don't know why it was not reached to wider community like uh, EOSC or a, a academic or LTA community. Uh, but uh, a, what I see, uh, it's the right way. Uh, but my question, uh, the session is called EOS Hub Contribution to EOS Architecture. Uh, do you see some problems? Because I see this is, would be real contribution to EOS Architecture, but this not happens at the level of EOS Architecture Working Group. This is my uh, uh, understanding. Do I understand correctly? Mm, let, let me, for about the first part of the question, about um, for the public consultation, we tried to make it, uh, I would say, as wide as possible. We also uh, pub published the post in the USC Secretariat platform to try to reach uh, uh, how many people as possible. So I'm sorry that it wasn't possible. But in any case, having feedback also, you want to provide me a feedback, uh, that would be fine. It will be surely, um, we will try to surely to take into account since this, uh, as I said, is something that uh, need to be done with an iterative approach. Uh, currently, there, are, there is open the public consultation on the help desk accounting and uh, and the monitoring technical specification. So I would invite you to have a look and provide your feedback. You can also try to put uh, some generic uh, statement in this about the general, uh, the general uh, approach. And we can try as much as possible to improve our approach, taking into account the comments from everybody. Thanks for this. For the second question, EOSCAB um, is part of the EOSCAB architecture working group. Mark is uh, the, uh, the EOSCAB person that's a member of the EOSCAB working group of the EOSC architecture working group. And uh, this work has been presented by Mark more than one time, I believe, to the EOSC architecture working group. Uh, I also presented this work during the EOSC symposium in a session that was uh, chaired by uh, Jean-François Bramatic. And I think there is also general interest, uh, also, also the working group on these activities. There should be um, also followed up in the next uh, project, just uh, project. Uh, mm, but currently the working group is, uh, is uh, mainly focusing on a few topics, so they didn't have the time to, to further contribute on this. This is what's my understanding. Mark, maybe you can, you can add something on this. Okay, D Diego, can I ask a follow-on question? Uh, yeah. what, is, uh, what is the foundation or background for this? For me, it resembles like you are moving in the direction of like DevOps, uh, uh, automatic service deployment, uh, design templates. Uh, am I correct or not? I think it is uh, strictly depends by the, the area that we are, um, the technical area that we take in consideration. And then from some area, the, all this aspect uh, would be very nice. Uh, um, there you go. Uh, I want to uh, intervene a little bit because we yeah. are running out of time for yes, uh, right. the other questions. Uh, but we can pick up this question also at the, at the end of uh, of the session uh, in the Q and A larger uh, section. Uh, it was also mentioned that there are some questions already in Slido, and also want to pick up those questions at the end of uh, the session. Uh, therefore, I want to go to uh, uh, Adrian for presenting uh, the accounting. Adrian works at the FCSC, part of the UK Research and Innovation. 
He has led on the April Users Akaki system for over uh, four years, to which he has been contributing to a number of EU projects, and the latest one is uh, EOS Cup. Adrian, I, yes, I see that you have uh, muted, so thank you. You can start. Yep, slides showing okay? Yes. Okay, cool. There we go. Uh, yes, so after the introduction, I'll cover the main features uh, of the OSC accounting, uh, look at the high level architecture, and then look at the different ways you can integrate with that architecture, and um, then finish with the interoperability guidelines. And yeah, this is all covered in more detail in the, um, the technical document um, that's been mentioned by Diego. Uh, so the EOS accounting service um, collects uh, various types of usage information for compute and storage and cloud VM usage um, and processes those and displays them um, via a portal. And so the, the value proposition for it is basically accounting is a central part of a federated infrastructure because um, you need to know that the money you're spending on these resources is being used um, and that the communities that have asked to use resources are getting um, the use of those resources. Uh, so the main features for the user, um, it provides aggregated views of their usage, um, sort of which, whichever resource center that usage occurred at, and also provides you views that allow their usage to be checked against their allocation. The resource providers, uh, it gives a provider-centric view of the resources used, so they can see who's using their resources. And it also allows uh, comparison to be made between resource providers um, in different groupings, depending on the topology of the federation. So uh, uh, different communities or different regions um, and so on. So the high level architecture um, is that resource centers implement some sort of collector that gathers metrics um, and then they're formatted into a standardized format. And then they're sent via messaging service uh, to a repository, um, which can then process those to give aggregations across all the different resource centers. These are then sent to an accounting portal and then the portal retrieves the topology information um, and community affiliations from other services um, to give you the uh, variety of views. Um, so in terms of integration, uh, resource centers can either directly publish uh, to the accounting the OSC, uh, central accounting repository, that's the top um, path, um, or they can have uh, their own intermediate repository, a, re sort of a regional repository automatic even um, and then another option is, as well is they have their own completely separate accounting system but to provide uh, sort of aggregated views across um, all the EOSC uh, infrastructure they can then also publish um, accounting records to the EOSC accounting repository so in terms of interoperability uh, we use a selection of standardized usage records and then the metrics uh, and units need to be in a compliant format and have the correct uh, semantics and um, in some places if URL pointers are used uh, these should ideally be public uh, to enable linking from the portal um, sometimes these are used for linking to metadata about um, the sort of VM images that are used uh, so this could link to your repository of VM Im images or something like that. Um, and I mentioned publishing via a messaging service. Um, alternatively, in some situations, we have um, agreed on HTTP API that we can pull the data from. Um, but this isn't widely used at the moment. And then the property information should follow um, that's the, the, uh, the version that's used by GOCDB. Uh, the, and yeah, the simplest way that a uh, resource center can integrate is just to register their services within GOCDB, um, as that will mean it's the same correct format. Um, but there are other ways to publish this information for topology. 
And then uh, lastly, yes, the AI should express uh, the group memberships in a standard way um, so that you can get the correct uh, views on your data as well. Um, yep, yeah, and that's me done. Okay, Adrian, thank you. Uh, then we go to uh, a Pavel presenting further details on uh, the help desk. Pavel is working at the Karls Institute of Technology in Germany. He's leading uh, ES Cup work packages with a focus on the integration and maintenance of the Federation collaboration services. Can we switch to Havel as presenter? Hello. Sarah, can we switch to Havel? Yes. Hi. Hi, Pavel. At the moment, I see. Sarah. Pavel, are, are you sharing your, your slide? No, I, I can't um, share yeah. my screen. Okay, can. can you share? There is the button Post. share screen on the Zoom. Otherwise, uh, I can put up your slide. Post disabled participant screen sharing. When I try to um, so let me push this button. That's okay. I will share your slides. Just let me. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Just a second. Okay. Can you see them? Yes, we can see them. Thank okay, you. so then I start. So um, yes. I will tell you a bit um, more details about the help desk, and this is a short outline. I will start with introduction. So the help desk is the entry point for EOSC users to submit incident report on issue or problem request information for, for the available uh, EOSC services. Um, on the other hand, the help desk is the, in the EOSC ecosystem is the backbone service uh, of the incident and request management process which facilitates uh, for example, communication between customers, users, and service providers, uh, also service recovery within agreed time. Uh, I think it's, it's a bit too far uh, what I see on the screen. I'm still by introduction. Okay. Is this not an automated, maybe? Got to transfer from one slide to the other? I think that that's why, because I was not, <laughs> okay. Okay, so, yes, so, and um, also it facilitates service recovery within agreed time in uh, SLA and um, allows to manage service requests um, submitted by the users uh, in consistent manner. So, uh, next slide, please. So um, first, I also would like to um, explain uh, main features of the help desk, which um, we also divide into target groups, uh, EOSC users and EOSC providers. Um, next. So the EOSC users uh, basically interested in creation of tickets uh, for any EOSC services, um, for any of EOSC service and hub and EOSC portfolios. Um, to have open um, access to all tickets um, uh, and uh, to have opportunity um, to submit ticket without login and get notifications uh, also have integrated access with the AI system. Uh, next. 
and um, EOS providers, uh, uh, on the other hand, um, they interested to uh, to get scalable and interoperable architecture uh, for direct uh, usage, um, so to say, help desk as a service um, and um, fast integration with external help desk systems if they are available. Also, uh, efficient ticket management is important and um, uh, uh, role and support unit management. Next. So uh, actually Diego already um, described shortly the main uh, integration op options um, we developed for service providers. So this is um, direct usage when the service provider gets support unit or group of support units um, and uh, get full management rights uh, uh, for them. Uh, another option is a ticket redirection uh, when the help desk just um, uh, used as a contact point and redirects tickets to the provider's mailing list uh, or ticket system. So this is a uh, um, less integrated solution. And uh, uh, the final is the full integration via the, the main API protocols. This is um, <clears throat> bidirectional synchronization of tickets in EOSC and provider's help desk. So uh, if, the help, uh, if the ticket created in the EOSC help desk, it's uh, immediately visible in the provider's help desk. And uh, also the service provider could um, manage tickets uh, in, um, uh, in the help desk uh, of the service provider. And then it's also visible, all changes are visible in the uh, EOSC help desk. Uh, next. Yeah, so this picture already uh, shown by Diego, I just um, um, added here, um, at the uh, top uh, EOSC portal and marketplace as a web uh, interfaces uh, for users to submit the ticket. And um, uh, I don't want them to, to uh, detail, describe it into detail. So just uh, if you go to next. Uh, uh, so there's the three options, uh, three different uh, integration options. Um, uh, provided for for this uh, architecture and um, if you go to the next uh, um, slide here um, is actually the current implementation in the EOS hub so <clears throat> here I would like to say a bit more details so uh, this is a multi-level um, structure of the support units so we start with a zero level on top which basically a self support for the users um, based on the uh, material provided in their portal, um, other automated procedures. And if it doesn't help, then the user actually uh, addresses uh, the request to the first level um, support. First level support using the uh, known error database uh, and manage the tickets and distribute it to the second level. Uh, or third level. So on the, at the second level, there are multiple uh, support units. Um, on the left side, you see a container of support units actually for the central EOSC operations uh, and uh, EOSC, um, uh, um, yeah, EOSC units like uh, service onboarding central uh, activities of the EOSC. On the right side, you see a container which contains uh, service providers and some of them can be fully integrated like we have currently for EGI help desk and UDAT or uh, use other options uh, which I pro presented um, before. And at the third level, this is uh, connected to the <clears throat> hub portfolio. It's a, a developer support for uh, uh, some uh, requests which cannot be solved at the second level and need some more uh, detailed consideration. Uh, next. So this is about the standards and technologies. Currently we have, for, uh, we have adopted uh, GIGAS, uh, which is a global grid user support and uh, it's integrated um, part XGAS, which is a lightweight system uh, for small NGIs. Uh, uh, this um, software um, has been successfully used for many years uh, for 
uh, by EGI and WLCG. And um, uh, there is a SOAP protocol which is used for integration with other help desks. Uh, on the right side of the slide, um, um, you see OTRS. This is uh, basically the future of the EOSC uh, help desk, which we are uh, slowly moving to. So this is open source software, which we um, will use uh, uh, next in future. And um, also um, um, actually uh, use all the uh, procedures we developed um, uh, so far uh, uh, with um, new uh, software. So it's not that we start from scratch, but all the uh, structure we currently developed, all the uh, standards and um, <clears throat> interoperability um, procedures will be just transferred to the new software. And uh, uh, we use uh, FITSM for the procedures and, and policies. So we have set of policies and procedures defined. Uh, uh, I don't go into detail. It's about how you manage the ticket and uh, how you open it, close it, and, um, and so on. Um, and the last uh, slide, um, I will say a few words about the future plans, which I already started. So uh, we're moving to the new platform based on the OTRS. Uh, which has modern user-friendly interface, uh, multiple communication channels. Um, uh, it provides also much quicker integration with uh, um, major uh, core components like AI, uh, uh, Jira, CMDB, other help desk systems. Uh, also provides SLA management, uh, which is uh, important uh, to properly um, um, manage the tickets according to the uh, FITSM and ITIL um, standards. And uh, it provides also customizable uh, workflows. So the plan uh, for this um, <clears throat> migration, so uh, currently we're collecting um, and uh, prioritizing the requirements. So feel free to, to contact me if you uh, have some requirements or questions. Um, also after this um, meeting. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, with preservation of the current best practices and established procedures. And we expect the first prototype uh, by the end of the year. And uh, we start uh, in the next year with assessment and validation of the uh, new platform uh, by stakeholders and uh, then come to production. So this so far for the future plans, which may be not directly related to the specification, but I think it's useful to, to also to, um, <clears throat> uh, to let you know. So that's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Pavel, uh, thank you. Uh, I see an, uh, a note in the chat, maybe you want to respond on this, that OTRS 7 and 8 is no longer open source. How does this relate to uh, uh, going this direction with the NEOS? Uh, yes, so as I mentioned, so we um, use the premium support, so um, it's um, um, it's still, I mean, there are two versions, so this is a community version and uh, a version which with the premium support, so we use the, the, the last one and um, uh, with a set of add-ons um, uh, to provide different functionality. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we go to uh, uh, Costas. Can we switch to Costas? Uh, Costas uh, has been uh, working with Jarnet since uh, 2002 and he's working as a senior project uh, manager on the infrastructures and is also the head of the department for European project strategy and proposals of the Directorate of European and International Infrastructure Projects. He has been involved within the infrastructures since 2003 and is currently the task leader of the EOSCOP for monitoring, accounting, messaging, and security tools. Costas, That's I see me. that. You can you see my screen? screen? Yes, I can share, I see your screen. And Thank does. You. Go ahead. All right, so um, I'm here to talk to you about us. Uh, Diego initially, let's say, presented the uh, corresponding specification for monitoring. Uh, we've been 
operating monitoring uh, with uh, in collaboration with uh, GNET SS, uh, search and CN, uh, and I2P3 CNRS for quite some years and we developed this specification on how we want to evolve and how we want we see that the monitor will happen in the EOS level of let's say cooperation. So we I will go briefly go through the main features of the monitoring service, um, what are the, the adopted technology where we proposed to, to be used, what is the high level architecture we seen that it, it operates and how we want to we want it to evolve and also what are the use cases and the interoperability options or integration options we, uh, we, we would like to uh, pro propose. Monitoring is the, is the key mechanism so that you can have an, uh, an insight of the current, let's say, uh, level of the services you are offering. In the, um, and what, what, when we talk about monitoring in this, in this context, we don't, talk about fabric monitoring, we mainly want to see what the end user sees. So we try to, uh, let's say, emulate what the user does and to try to identify and correlate the, the problems that may appear. For example, that a user may not have access or enough quota, that um, a service may be, let's say, a site may be uh, up, but the database behind it is not. So that for the end user, he will see a, a, a service 500 error. We want to, to do that so that we can quickly inform the owners of the service that there is a problem X, Y, Z, and what is the problem as much as we can understand from the outside, a black box testing. And we want to also monitor the conformance to the multiple SLAs that may be in place. So it doesn't really matter that if the service is up only, but if the service responds within the, the, the agreed time, that the availability, the availability of the service is above what the SLA requires, and all this information that uh, assists us in order to provide available and reliable services, i.e. good quality services that conform to the SLAs. What, more, what are the main features of, a, of such a monitoring service? It's A, of course, monitoring service. Monitoring service from the user perspective, i.e. try to understand what, what the user will do if it's an FTP server, not just ping the FTP that the FTP is there, but try to upload a file, download a file, delete a file, do all the operations the user will do. Then we collect these results and do a reporting on the availability and reliability of the service as the user will see it. We do offer, of course, a visualization of the service status and how the service behaves throughout time. We do provide dashboard interface so that you can see and get the errors and you can understand what's going on now and what is the quality of its service and if all the service dependencies behind it. And one more feature what we've seen that and it's, it's been high demand is real-time alerts. I, we don't want someone to you know, have a dashboard open and on the desktop and uh, you know, have someone monitoring that. We want to be able to send an alert to the individual service admin and, and notify them, hey, we've noticed this problem which caused by XYZ issue. Can you please fix that as up? In a scale of like EOS or in a scale of EOS Hub, it, it, it makes sense that we do, we do need to have multiple entry points, right? for example, multiple topologies, multiple of profiles, multiple um, uh, probes and ideas that we, we, we need to import to the system. We, don't, we cannot say that this is the topology that is defined by only one um, source. You need to be able to combine multiple en entry points. You need to be able to combine multiple different systems that may be producing topology, that may be producing data, uh, monitoring data for, for this. You do, you, do, you do need to be able to be interoperable with data and try to understand what other systems do and try to import these into the system to provide a unified view. Of course, it needs to be highly available. It's, it's, and to be so, it needs to have uh, multiple instances of the same component running in, 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 in parallel. It needs to be loosely coupled so if something fades, you can easily replace it with, some, with a new instance or and try to, to, to scale out as needed. 
and you properly need to support also different tenants so that for example an infrastructure can have only let's say can have their own view and their own let's say uh, profiles for this which can then be also integrated with um, let's say the global view but they probably need to have their own unique way to monitor things the standards we, uh, we uh, all all the, the components we've uh, we've used and all the components that they are defined in this spec are based on open open source software like uh, Django, Python, and op and languages like Java or GoLang. We do use uh, the Avro schema as the mechanism to transfer the data as the encapsulation um, schema. And for the computation of all these, we've, we've been using the last couple of years Apache Flink, and it seems to be been working quite nicely, and it's quite flexible enough in order to be extended to do more things. Um, sorry, because I have this thing in front of me. The high level architecture of the monitoring service starts with what we call the source of truth. The source of truth give us the topology we need to monitor, we give us the profiles that we need to monitor, give us the factors that we need to take into account in order to be able to do our, our computation for availability, reliability, or status. This is then passed on to the monitoring engines. The monitoring engines execute the, the probes, the metrics, and the profiles, and produce results which are sent to the messaging service to be transferred to the computation engine. The computation engine uses the profiles from the source of truth and knows the topology and the, what kind of computation you want to do. For example, if you have uh, two FTP servers in high availability, you will do an OR uh, kind of um, action on them, uh, addition to them, saying that if one of them is available, then you should, then, then the availability, availability of the service is, is high, even though you can get a warning because one of them is not available, so you have limited capacity, for, for example. But the same data and the same uh, uh, service is up. If the, the two FTP servers hold different data, then you want to do an AND between them, showing that, yes, the FTP service is up, but there's a big problem because some, part of the data you want to serve is not available. This is then passed to the, uh, the compute engine, then is connected with a web API which offers all these results in a number of different reports which the web UE uses in order to produce the dashboards we wanted, we, I mentioned earlier. Of course, they, they, all of the components are interchangeable and all of the components use public APIs, that, or, sorry, sorry, APIs so, or, me, or the messaging service so that we can, for example, offer a solution if someone wants to of, uh, to use uh, their own portal, for example, they can simply import data from the API. But we'll talk about this in the use case we have later on. Um, I'm sort of mentioned this, the, 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 the components we have. I will go through them again briefly. It's the monitoring engine that is, acts like a broker or the um, a cron job and executes the jobs and collects the results, which is then sent to the uh, messaging service. It's, we have a configuration. We, we will probably we will need to have a configuration wide so that we can define all these metrics. Where is that? Where is the, what is the source of the topology? What are the metrics you want to do? What are the um, um, profiles you want to use? And and define give to the the compute engine and the the full let's say blown. Uh, uh, I, diagram what workflow what they, what needs to be done in order to get the results we need to have you need to have a computation engine that is uh, that is able to do all these computations and use the metrics and provide calculate the status and availability and availability results and on the on the other at the same time it will all it's also integrated with the, the alert engine which will all will, if it sees a failure somewhere, it will, it will spawn the, the alert mechanism, the notification mechanism that can be integrated with either email, Slack, or whatever the, the end channel appears to be. We do need a web API because we collect data 
for quite a, a big period of time. So uh, providing an API so that you can see the results th throughout time and be able to ask for more or, or a recomputation, for example, if, if there's a well-known problem in an uh, internet provider, for example, you can ask for some parts to be excluded due to that fact that it was something beyond your control. And then, of course, we do. You do for all. Everybody wants to see a nice web interface where all these results are presented in a very, way, in a very, able to say, good manner. Um, so, in order not to take much time from you, I will go on then to the interoperability guidelines and what we foresee as use case scenarios in order for uh, either a service provider or an infrastructure or a uh, third party to be using this, uh, this EOS monitoring service. Uh, the first and uh, I'll say the, the initial use case we, we, we already have already started working on is the use case where two different facilities, let's for, for example, EGI or EUDAT, want to combine services and, and have a combined view of their services. This can be done by by the by the computation engine where the two tenants can be merged and provide one called say merge report. Similarly, um, another use case is the, the use case where a service provider wants to join and be a, uh, and be a monitor he, it's he, his or her services um, while not willing to go for a full blown tenant for their own idea of let's say uh, this will simply mean that they need to a provide a topology and b um, provide the probes or the metrics they want to check against the service. So we need to define these and what are the calculations we need to do on the services in order to provide the results, and then it can be combined on their own. Um, I went through the first two of them. The third party, the third use case is that the, somebody else wants to use the morning data. This could be, for example, that the EOS portal wants to drill in and um, use the monitoring data we collect and present them somewhere else, or that a research infrastructure that is using um, a part of the EOS services wants to pick up the specific results or the raw performance data and use them in their own in their own portals or in their own, let's say, uh, mechanism, so that they can also take into account the results of the, let's say, um, baseline services they use from EOS, so that they can understand that why their their own services on top of the baseline, for example, cloud compute or data storages, data services, are uh, yes, operating. Yes. A short question: How many slides do you have? Uh, one, one more. Okay, thanks. Um, this is how Argo, the, the current service we have in EOS Hub, actually uh, implements this specification. I, uh, you, can, you can ask me more questions later on if you want, but in, in essence, the, you can uh, expect that the, all the, whatever I described as the specification is already implemented by Argo. And on this slide, you can see some examples of the current dashboards we already have. One of them is for the EGI, one of them is for EUDAT, and the last one, the newest one we have, which is still in develop instance, is the EOS portal one, which is a new tenant that uses a completely different topology. I, I use this uh, screenshot exactly because I want to show that we don't really need to be uh, taking a full-blown topology like CockDB or TPMT. We can be use a smaller level of, let's say, a flat topology and produce still produce be able to produce results according to the metrics they have and that is all for me i hope i was fast enough for you mark yeah um one last thing there is a full-blown training that uh, we, we did demonstrate all this tomorrow yeah tomorrow morning okay thank you and uh, then I want to go to uh, uh, the next one, and that will be about an, a community use case, which is from Opal Coast. Joa, can you switch? Can we switch to yeah, Joa? 
Okay, yes. Okay. Okay, thank can you. We yes, we can see the slides. Thank you, go ahead. Hello, my name is João. I work at Linac in Portugal as one of the developers of the Open Coast service. Today, me and my colleague Samuel are going to tell you a, a little bit about our adventure integrating Open Coast with Elas Hub resources and services. But before we get into the technical details, let me just give you a brief overview of what the service is and what it has to offer. In a nutshell, Open Coast is an op operational forecast service for coastal waters, a bit like the weather predictions that everyone knows, but for coastal water bodies. You may ask, why do we need such forecasts? So they are useful for a bunch of stuff, things like anticipate contamination events and support emerg emergency actions, support water economy daily tests and recreation activities, guide management to minimize risks in the coastal areas, among others. The Open Coast Service assembles on-demand circulation forecast systems for selected coastal areas and generates daily forecasts of water levels, wave parameters, 2D and 3D velocities, and 3D salinities and temperatures over the region of interest for 48 hours, based on numerical simulations of all the relevant physical processes. Um, so we have a little bit of statistics on the, the providers. Uh, next, a little bit about, about, about the uh, web app. Uh, the service has three components. A configuration assistant, which allows the user to set up a new forecast step by step. He or she only has to provide a mesh of the region to simulate, specifying the forcings and a few other parameters, and that's it. Then we have the forecast manager, which allows the user to check and manage um, uh, his or her own forecast systems. And then the last one, the viewer, which allows the user to check the results and see how the results fare against real data. And now my colleague Samuel will present some details about the infrastructure supporting the service. I don't know if Samuel... Yes, yes. Um, so um, for open coast architecture, uh, we start to, to review uh, the thematic service that, that exists in uh, EOS catalog. And for that, we uh, select a GI check-in for users authentication, a GI cloud compute to provide compute resources for front-end and back-end, a GI cloud container compute uh, using view Docker, a GI ice output compute to run the simulations, and also a GI workload manager. This uh, also uses the interoperability guidelines uh, provided by EOS core services, as mentioned in the presentation before. So uh, for uh, the next slide, I have uh, uh, here uh, the, some integration challenges that we have from the uh, current service and to integrate them with the thematic services. So the, the problem here was uh, to uh, integrate with the federation. So we need to review the authentication and authorization uh, services. For that, we use federated authentication using a GI check-in for open cost users. Uh, also, we need proxy certificates for grid services, where we use uh, robo 
uh, certificate. Also, we need federated authentication to access data repositories, such as UDAPT. Then we need to, to do the service models creation, that this stands for uh, try to do the service deployment using infrastructure as a service into resource providers, use Iraq REST uh, full API to allow that integration to software. This is also the first case requesting this service from AGI. Also that data, data transfer between cloud and grid environments using Storm WebDAV with proxy certificates. Uh, so uh, for open cost cloud, as you can see in the image on the right, so the dashed uh, rectangle there, uh, we need to deploy all uh, the services for open cost environment using virtual machines in the cloud. Uh, then we need to uh, adapt the software that was previous only deployed in the cloud to work with the grid. For that, uh, we need to create an image that you can see in the image on the right that needs to be integrated with CVMFS so we can deploy it to the, the, the grid and have the jobs, so all the computation task works, submitted through Dirac to the grid. Um, so uh, in the next slide, uh, for open cost grid, we also def need to define the pilot to prepare a necessary environment to run the, the work in the grid side. Uh, also, uh, we, we use UDocker to provide the, the required environment uh, to run the software and also loads the image. And this provides the better integration for software demands uh, into the worker nodes environment. Uh, so in the next slide, uh, I have also here another issue that is related to, to data. So uh, we need to transfer data between the cloud and the grid and also, we need to share the, the products of the computation. So we need to transfer data between uh, the cloud and the grid, and also put their, that data in a repository. For that, we uh, use uh, Storm, as I uh, mentioned before, using WebDAV, that allows to do the transfer between the cloud and grid and all data between the computation and the registration in the cloud side. And this uses uh, some different authorization models. We have in the grid uh, uh, proxy certificates authorization, and in the cloud, we have uh, federated authentication and authorization uh, using OAuth. So for here, we need to link then uh, to a data repository the data for instance, using a solution like uh, B2Share from UDAP that use RESTful API services that are integrated with AGI check-in and also uh, submit uh, the jobs into the grid. This kind of solution tends to pass through the backend that you see there in the, in the left of the image that do all these kind of uh, translations. So, uh, there is also another uh, problem that we need to solve that is about Dirac. Uh, in the next slide, um, we need to solve some limitations that, that exist in Dirac API. Uh, so there are internal dependencies inherited by API requirements that break the open code software, other maintenance tasks to follow supported services re releases, and these kind of limitations, we could solve them using Dirac RESTful API that provides a better abstraction, only requiring to follow the specification and flexible software development independent from Dirac service deployment. This is just kind of deployment that we show here and that uh, allows us to tackle some uh, problems and uh, allow better integration uh, for future releases. So now I will pass the message to my 
colleague João that will explain uh, more some details about this. Okay, so to end the presentation, just let me just share as an EOS Hub service developer some advice and tips that may be helpful. So regarding EGI check-in, uh, it can be very useful to offload the re responsibility of keeping some sensitive information. Uh, regarding DRAC, uh, having a proxy broker that handles uh, the DRAC submission jobs adds a bit of complexity, but at the same time isolates DRAC software dependencies and, software, uh, and interfaces and allows to manage shared information like authentication tokens and resources, resource usage cleanly and to abstract much of the internal details of Dirac for users and clients. Uh, the Dirac web portal uh, can be very useful to uh, monitor uh, executions within the Dirac itself. And the UDocker, which is a non-root container engine uh, that allows us to provide the necessary software uh, to run our simulation model in uh, resources which weren't uh, previously set up to have all the dependencies needed to, to run the software. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chao and Shango. Uh, I hope that uh, the, the, the interoperability guidelines were very useful. Maybe you can comment on this. Uh, so regarding the, the integration, uh, most of them, or at least some of them, weren't available at the time we were doing this kind of integration. Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe Samuel can add a, a little bit to that. Yes, so uh, the tackle here about the instructions were more, more like about understanding how we can use the thematic services and uh, uh, integrate them and provide them uh, in the architecture. So we need to divide, as uh, presented before, in three kind of uh, uh, approaches. So we need to view the thematic service that we need to uh, integrate. Then uh, we have also some common functions that we need to uh, parse in the middle and also uh, the context of the services. This is the kind of uh, challenge that I showed uh, as some of the challenges like integrating the authentication, authorization, and the, the computation, and this kind of uh, um, uh, things is what we need to understand when we start to integrate uh, these services into else uh, thematic services. Okay, thank you. Um, these were all uh, uh, all the presentations. Now I want to switch switch to uh, uh, Slido. Um, Sarah, can you switch to Slido? Yeah, I'm doing that. Um, because we have still very limited time, uh, I want to skip the the, the poll. Uh, and just uh, focus on uh, on the questions. Uh, that is okay. Uh, the, the first question with the highest uh, uh, thumbs up. Do you expect the metric service, de service developers to organize their services into building blocks or only federation access enabling service will be organized in that way? Uh, Diego, can I ask you to provide an answer on this? Yeah, sure, okay, Mark. Uh, in general, the, um, the framework that we have developed uh, is for the type of services, so um, also for the thematic services. In our work in EOSCAB, also considering the expertise within the project, we, we decided to focus mainly on the federation and, uh, and uh, access enabling services and the common services, but, uh, um, but the framework can be also applied or, without any issue 
on the on the thematic services. Uh, obviously, as the services should be split in building block, uh, depends uh, on the specific thematic area. So we need the people with expertise on the on the thematic area to identify and define the building blocks. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Uh, I can uh, complement maybe on this is that uh, uh, within uh, EOSC you can use uh, EOSC uh, for as a channel to promote which standards you use, but then you have to describe it a little bit as as how you want to promote those for different kinds of functionalities, and those are then more aggregators in the building blocks. Uh, another question is also from, uh, from Dusan. Uh, so, if a service is using its own help desk, integration with a central EOSC help desk will be required during the onboarding process. Um, I can answer this uh, by myself. Uh, it is not mandatory uh, to integrate your help desk system uh, with uh, the, uh, the central EOSC help desk system. It is optionally. Um, and the interoperability guidelines will then provide more information about how you integrate in, can integrate uh, your help desk with the central one uh, uh, which are the, the, the guidelines and procedures for for doing this but we also provide different options for different levels of integration so it is not mandatory um, mark Poitier, uh impressive plan very top down though Basics from local, standalone vision, um, portal standard, data set format replacing uh, CSV, GBIF, and some others, uh, and what not. Making data, edit, analyze tooling openly readable across all domains. Uh, W3C uh, and OKFM as part of the solution. Um, I'm Maybe it can be shown that it is top down, but it is not to be top down because it is really to be about uh, bottom up. Uh, so that we open that uh, uh, defining those interoperability guidelines uh, should come and in collaboration with all researchers, research infrastructures, infrastructure providers to define, okay, what are the useful uh, uh, building blocks, but also what are then the interoperability guidelines for uh, uh, integrating and making use of those uh, uh, building blocks. So it is really to be a very collaborative work uh, uh, to define those guidelines uh, instead of that it is defined from top uh, and then, then you have to use it. It is also, therefore it is also the definition that it is a reference architecture so that you have all the freedom of making use of those guidelines. But if you have your own standards, is still allowed that you have those uh, uh, standards by your own. So it is not mandatory. Therefore, it is also a proposal to have a reference architecture. Mark, uh, sorry. Maybe, maybe I can also add something uh, on, this, on this question. Uh, very quickly, uh, um, I fully agree with what Mark said. And this bottom-up approach uh, can be also seen in the technical the specification building blocks we decide to work with. I mean, with an analysis of the use cases, we can choose the, the building blocks that should be properly specified according to the needs of the user communities. So this should, do, should balance the effort, I would say. That's all from my side. Okay. I hope this uh, answered uh, the question to you, Mark. Uh, Manuel Bernal, uh, is it possible to actively participate in the design of the interoperability guidelines of evolutionary process? I said yes, and I think that is also uh, one of the, the purposes and the scope. If you uh, look at how we discuss this, for example, in uh, the proposal preparation for infra eos 3 we want to uh, set up a very similar model for example, and we have been looking to this as from the EOS uh, uh, working groups and the architecture working group where we have a flexible model for defining task forces for defining those interoperability guidelines. And that should be open to, to anyone who wants to participate. Um, how easily we can extend the current monitoring 
to cover some aspects of the repository monitoring currently produced by uh, OpenDoer, OpenAir, etc. Is it expected to further develop of the monitoring might to go into this direction? Kastas, uh, can I ask you to comment on this? Um, I think Sam was prepared to answer this question when she oh. saw it. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's the same. Uh, the monitoring service is flexible enough and can accept and compute different sources, so I don't think a really huge problem. But although we don't know exactly how the repository monitoring is in details, I think that we could find a solution to what a part of it. There is also a training tomorrow where we can, uh, uh, in the afternoon at 2.30, so if once we can discuss it also there. Okay, thank you. I will add also the URL to the slide. Uh, I think that I will go through the uh, four questions which are still uh, uh, available because we're running into the deadline. Another real world issue, bottom up, I see on the ground that uh, we plan for data to be linked up on global level, but people lack the tools, knowledge, vocabulary to describe and document the, the nature of the data. Uh, schema, semantics, units, values, procedures to be integral, reusable. Um, yes, uh, a lot of those knowledge is still uh, uh, is lacking, um, but I think this is uh, to have those interoperability guidelines for different levels, also not only just for uh, the technical, for the services, but also for the other levels as on, uh, on, on data, so that you have to find uh, frameworks for doing this and promote those frameworks. Uh, it should improve, but it probably will say, take time to improve, to set those uh, the, uh, uh, guidelines, but also the adaptation of those guidelines will, will take some time. But I think the first start is for uh, starting with uh, defining guidelines. A question from Raymond at Diego. In addition to the technical side, another important uh, comes from policies and procedures for operating on help desk. Uh, communication, resolution time for a ticket, is this to be addressed within uh, the documents? Diego. Yeah, no. Or, the, or maybe the, Pavel. I can say something and maybe Pavel can complement. Uh, the technical specification is focusing on the technical aspect in the architecture and the integration from a technical point of view. We have a parallel effort on defining also the policy and procedure for operating the help desk. This is something Pavel showed in this slide when he presented the difference, the support unit structure. I don't know, Pavel, if you want to add on that? Yeah, that's true. So the, the procedures and policies defined uh, in the uh, ESRM process uh, and uh, followed uh, by the ticket uh, management uh, daily so uh, this is not uh, uh, directly addressed in the specification but uh, it's a complementary uh, information uh, defined in the process definition yeah right so technical specification are complemented by, by with the relevant uh, process of the use carbon service management system thank you Pavel. okay uh, this was an message from Custos to find to, to see where uh, you can find the uh, guidelines and observability guidelines. Then we have um, a question from uh, Walter Bonstra to add to Mark's question. How does this top-down approach compare to the vision of creating a web of Kyle Leibniz described it yesterday? Um, I think that the, 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 we try to be as open as possible to allow as many of different uh, opinions uh, and different views. Uh, uh, but during discussion uh, that we come to uh, some uh, uh, progress so that what would be the best standards to adapt uh, for the future. And uh, multiple guidelines can be provided, but also multiple uh, visions can be uh, uh, defined on this. Uh, but I think that is also part of uh, the collaboration uh, for the, the bottom-up approach uh, that everyone can contribute to see what is the best direction you can go to. Uh, Manuel Bernal, uh, how is the ticketry direction implemented? 
I think that is at the moment very specific uh, to technical implementation. I would propose that this should be part of the uh, interoperability guidelines. Um, I think the last question was in thumbs up. The adaptation of standards and well-known APIs as part of the EOSC interoperability guidelines. How are these standards and APIs chosen? It is, is it possible to get an overview of standards and APIs uh, to use for proper integration with EOSC? How to follow further decisions and developments? I think this is a part of, of, of the defining those guidelines uh, and uh, the, the choosing uh, of which uh, standards and APIs best to promote through EOSC is part of, of the process of the discussion or the collaboration so that you can come to an agreement which are the best standards uh, uh, and APIs uh, to promote. And that I think part is also part of the work we try to do within uh, EOSCAP, but also in the future, but also within, for example, the EOSCAP architecture working group, which is currently uh, uh, developing guidelines for, for example, on the PEDs and the policies, uh, but also for the AI. Um, I think this is the last question uh, for uh, uh, Milan. How do you resolve scalability of monitoring service if you will have a lot of services with a lot of monitoring variables? Gustas, uh, Timus, who is the best of you to answer this scalability question? I can answer this. It's uh, it's rather uh, easy. The uh, the design of the current architecture of the monitoring service is by design scalable, and we can add more compute engines, more monitoring engines, or, or more of whatever component may might be needed. And this can allow us to scale out and have different a lot more. Um, say, if you add more monitoring, engines, you can have more probes. If you have add more, let's say, power to the compute engine, you can do more calculations at the same time. Now, uh, taking this into account, the scalability, as I said, is built in in the design we've done. On the other hand, uh, monitoring as we as we see it, at least at the EOSC level, should not care about uh, disk uh, space or things like that. This is fabric monitoring that each uh, service provider should do on, the, on their own. Uh, we we don't aim or, or we don't foresee at least that we were going to do what is called fabric monitoring. If, for example, uh, there's enough disk space in the system, if there is enough memory in the system, or if there is uh, enough connectivity in the system. As I said in my presentation, what we do is we monitor what the user will see. If you offer a service which ha doesn't have the enough capacity for, from the point of view of the user, then the only thing we can say to you is that you don't have enough capacity for us. It's not a, it's not up to us to do health check monitoring if the CPU is has a greater load in your system or if the disk is full. Okay. It's it's the main our focus is to to do what the user does in your system and report on that. For this, it is more a functional monitoring if the service does what it should do. But it is yeah. not the, the local monitoring if the service is operating correctly as or performing as, as you want. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, this was the, the, the final question. Uh, sorry to be a few minutes late in this session. Uh, I want to thank all uh, presenters uh, for their contributions and I want to thank you all for attending uh, uh, this session. Um, thank you. And I think we can conclude this uh, uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Hi. Sarah, so, uh, can I assume that you will close down the session? Yes. Uh, Diego, you can stop the recording. Sarah.